welcome, hello, good afternoon um, to Latin American Studies 201 with me, John Beasley Murray. And I'm very excited to have Shane Green uh, with us here. Shane Green is professor of anthropology at uh, Indiana. And um, he's written uh, this article on uh, Peruvian punk, which we're going to chat about now. So thanks so much, Shane, for doing this. My pleasure, glad to be here. I, and I wonder if you could just start off by saying just a little bit about um, punk in Peru, the history of punk in Peru, which is probably not the first association that we make. So how did, uh, what is the history of, of, of Peruvian punk? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of different kind of directions that that conversation can go in, some of which are probably somewhat irrelevant to your purposes. But like um, uh, this, the way I narrate it uh, is basically, you know, there's a kind of global explosion of punk scenes almost everywhere in the world or many parts of the world in the late 1970s that then, you know, take kind of multiple different directions. Right. Um, and sort of when exactly one wants to kind of mark an interesting or creative or a kind of original moment starting to happen. Um, for me, it's really the birth of this scene I call that, that was called in the sort of early to mid uh, 1980s, the rock subterraneo scene. There were, you know, previous instance, instances of other bands in the late 70s, and particularly this band Anarquia, which was mostly a cover band um, um, by good musicians just interested in kind of exploring this kind of emergent new world of kind of sort of the punk sound and aesthetic. Uh, but it's not really till 82, 83, 84 that like, you know, there's sort of a series of different bands, an initial kind of group of bands, a scene as it were, that kind of starts to emerge, uh, singing in Spanish, composing original songs, and eventually not really until kind of the, the, the start of 1985, uh, going beyond just playing shows at bars and clubs and so on and so forth and actually starting to record, uh, which is also kind of, you know, an important moment, particularly in the context of this article, which is a lot about kind of questions of, you know, what we can read into music, different kinds of musical formats. Um, so it's really for me that kind of moment of 83 to 85, the birth of this, this thing that in Peru and in Lima was called rock subterraneo, um, which also gives rise to this notion of the subte, that the sort of the localized national way of talking about punk, given this history in Peru, pretty much unlike almost anywhere else in the world, um, is that there's a different terminology for it, right? The idea of underground rock and the sort of creation of this figure of the subte, the under. Um, who is that kind of icon, icon, iconic instantiation of it, right? So that's the, uh, that's the that's the answer I give. There's a long kind of tangent that goes off into the 1960s about this garage band called Los Psychos, um, but let's not do that because it's not in the article and sort of takes us in a long, more kind of, you know, different direction, so. Um, we, we won't do that, but sometimes <laughs> it says that punk is invented in Peru in the 1960s of yeah, Los Psychos. That's the thing. For those interested, go check that out. It's a weird, mostly 2000 to the present debate about whether or not this, this sort of relatively obscure, now much less obscure garage band from Lima in the mid 1960s is, you know, the, the real proto-punk as opposed to the stories that typically get called, told about the Stooges and the Sonics and whoever else, right, in the U.S. usually. Um, but yes, yeah. you're, you're talking about another moment in, um, in the late 1970s uh, maybe early 1980s, in in which uh, people in Peru are listening to um, what's being produced elsewhere in the United States, um, in in the UK and elsewhere. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned in your article is um, who gets access to this stuff. That is, is mainly people who have the money um, uh, to to travel and they pick up some of these um, discs uh, on their travels. So who are the uh, who are the punks in Peru and, and to what extent does that change? Uh, I think you say that at least initially they tended to be the educated upper classes or the, well, obviously the, the young or the, the children of the educated upper classes. Yeah. And, you know, to be more kind of blunt about that, the black sheep of those families, <laughs> right? Typically that's often how they would, in terms of at least the ones that I've met and interviewed, how they would often kind of describe themselves. Um, but there's, there's a kind of unfolding that takes place. Like initially just because of the kind of North South, or at that moment in history, right, sort of first world, third world kind of terminology that we would sort of index. Um, people who would have had access to, to vinyl productions of punk or underground forms of rock just emerging in the mid and, 19, and late 1970s were inevitably people who had some sort of access to foreign markets, right, foreign travel, family members abroad, 
Um, maybe they were studying at some of the more elite kind of foreign language schools, private schools in Lima and who had foreign students like expats or whatever in them, those kinds of things. So they were sort of initially kind of the points of access for these kinds of things, these forms of popular culture, uh, quote unquote, invented elsewhere. Um, but very quickly, as the article itself kind of narrates, like as soon as different kinds of formats um, come into play, other kinds of classes and actors come into play, right? So the, the introduction of the cassette in the early 1980s, just like the introduction of photocopy technology in a print sense, right, um, was absolutely crucial for kind of expanding this outward to other lower sectors of the middle class and the even lower middle class, the mestizo sort of sector, urban sector. Um, I think it takes, to be honest, um, a, a while. There are definitely cases of sort of cholo punks um, from much more kind of working class um, barrios uh, in Lima getting involved in the punk scene at this early moment. But it takes a while to kind of work itself out in part because frankly, rock, generally speaking, is a very minority genre in a country like Peru where cumbia and at that time chicha was very dominant um, and folkloric music and criollo music and all that kind of stuff. It's just always completely dominated people's sense of musical taste, right? So um, it took a while for it to come out. I think it's really with the birth of the kind of digital era that it really still in a kind of minority fashion, but like some, I think recent kind of polls, like it's only about 5% of the Peruvian population that even gives a shit about rock, generally speaking, much less something really as specific as, you know, underground punk, right? So um, it takes a while, but the, you know, the points of access are kind of the black sheep members of elite families that then via this kind of diversification that technology, cheap technology like cassettes offers, um, it becomes more accessible to a lot, a lot of other people, right? Slowly but surely. Um, so you talk a little bit about, in fact, you talk a lot, in fact, about the, the point of which uh, people in Peru uh, start not just listening to um, uh, punk music uh, that comes from elsewhere, but pr producing their own uh, uh, music. And uh, you talk about, uh, there's that punk ethos, right? That a anyone can do it. A anyone can start up a band, the notion you just need a couple of chords and so on. And I wonder if you could uh, talk a little through um, the, the the ways in which people such as you use the example of, of narcosis um, start producing um, music punk music and, and how that fits into w what you call underproduction and the notion of underproduction as the part of a punk ethos yeah I mean you know the, in that particular article and then in the book this kind of article is connected to narcosis is a kind of emblematic example in part because it literally is the title of this demo amateurish kind of um, demo cassette that they kind of um, recorded literally in a garage and then we chose the, the, the vocalist's house um, took on a kind of iconic status but, but because it was first and the title of it is, is primera dosis no first dose basically like meaning sort of first do, first real attempt to put to in a recording format peruvian punk rather than just being playing live shows and practicing in garages and inviting your friends to the to the local bar and so on and so forth right so it's really important in that sense i mean the um <clears throat> there's other dimensions that i analyze in the article um that have to do with the way that combining this particular material mode of producing uh, under very, very difficult conditions. Like it was really difficult to get even instruments. A lot of times you were renting instruments or borrowing instruments. They were really shitty quality. Um, maybe you sort of, you know, particularly if you're in the middle class or upper middle class kind of pulled some resources and like rented a little bit of studio time in a few cases. Um, but it was like a few hours, like at one in the morning when nobody else was around and the rates were cheap. There were minimal even studios to be had actually at that particular time in Peru. Um, and a lot of times you resorted to more kind of, you know, kind of homemade kind of technology the way that Narcosis did, right? With just like looking for microphones that he was basically hooking up, you know, microphones to a Sony shoebox recorder, which no one of this generation even knows what that is, but like, you know, you and I do. Um, uh, to sort of craft these kinds of recordings, right? And so like, you know, it's, it's the Peruvian version of, DIY, of what punks have long called DIY, right? Um, and my sort of, you know, a, attempt to play with that in a more kind of academic or intellectual or theoretical sense in the article and also in the book is just to sort of think about it in light of a, a certain kind of inspired cultural Marxism, I suppose, somewhat kind of derived from Benjamin and those ideas of sort of like the ways that kind of modernity introduces new forms 
of creative technology that can be used and put to different kinds of purposes, um, including different kinds of political purposes, as well as different kinds of aesthetic purposes, right? Um, but simultaneously, particularly in the, in the scope of that article, um, it's kind of direct, uh, addressed to what goes by the name sound studies or even format studies, Jonathan Stern and David Novak and, and people who sort of are interested in taking something like musical format um, or the format through which sound is produced and distributed and consumed and opening up this Pandora's box of how that connects to questions of sociality and, and politics and history and so on and so forth. So it's my, my play with that as well, right? Um, primarily, and it's, it's just, a, you know, it's just a hoity-toity way of talking about um, uh, DIY in, in this kind of proving context in a basic sense. Now you play with, and I like this a lot, um, the notion, well, the, the fact that production means at least two things in this context. It means both a sort of economic, you know, producing things, making things, uh, but it's also specifically, um, uh, you know, a, a, a piece of music is produced, right? And, and, and it can be overproduced when it becomes too finicky, too much work has been put on it. And, and again, this notion there's something rough and ready here about the punk in general, and, and in particular ways, uh, narcosis and, and Peruvian punk, perhaps um, more generally. Yeah. I, I love the, the notion also um, that what you have, because of the ways in which uh, this guy is making this particular tape that you, you, you talk about, there's no original. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. And then the way in that it gets distributed um, through tape cassettes, uh, which again, there's probably plenty of people who are not quite sure what a tape cassette is, but um, I still have a cassette player. But um, uh, in which the the the, the quality uh, deteriorates over time as uh, as as more and more copies um, get made, um, but that also enables uh, the uh, the music to have um, to have scale, if not scope, right? To have to have a, a widespread impact, um, even though it perhaps it's not quantitatively um, widespread. I, I don't know if you could say a little bit more uh, about that, about the, the 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 copies, the question of copies, and how that goes against um, what what you call a sort of fetishization sometimes for authenticity and the original. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things. First of all, just in terms of sort of addressing this, at least in part or maybe in whole, to a like younger audience that's grown up with the kind of normalization of digital media as the dominant form. Um, it's not an, first of all, the whole point is it's not an absolute separation. There are ways, like the way that kind of pirated forms of digital music circulate are not fundamentally in certain ways different than the ways that cassette technology in an analog format made possible, right? Which was not the whole point being, and this is where the kind of question of authenticity comes in, was not possible with vinyl. You can't, nobody has a fucking vinyl press in their house, <laughs> right? You know, and you, there's no such thing as a like dual to dual kind of cassette, double, to, you know, sort of double cassette deck for vinyl. You have to minimally send your money off to the vinyl pressing plant if they're willing to produce your independently produced vinyl, right? And or be part of the official mainstream kind of commercial circuit. Um, of vinyl production, which was the standard back in those days, right? Um, and you know, for that for that matter, like both symbolically and realistically speaking, like the playlists that we now work with on Spotify and YouTube and so on and so forth are like literally derived from mixed cassette tapes that you recorded for your friend, right? Um, where you got to rearrange the order of the songs and so on and so forth. There's like there's an interesting historical dialogue taking place between these different formats, right? Um, but the whole point being that there, like, there are certain kind of formats that are really just predisposed to allow for widespread immediate kind of distribution, right? And copying and sort of piracy, self-piracy in a way that other formats precisely protect from that, right? So vinyl is something that protects from that, right? And in that sense, it, it holds a certain kind of um, authenticity, right? Um, entre comillas, uh, uh, within it, within the format itself, right? This is why, for example, you know, people are so, particularly of our generation, so super proud of their huge vinyl collection and not proud of their, like, you know, the 57 cassettes they still have laying around from the 1980s, right? There are little weird niches and like subcultures of people who fetishize the cassette. And I talk a little bit about that in this context because in Peru, it's precisely not vinyl from that era that's fetishized. It's the cassette because that was the medium. That was the only one that people had access to, at least in this particular, in this particular scene, right? In that particular context. Um, 
And so even that is sort of relative to context in that sense. Um, but I was, you know, the, the, the narcosis is just one example of many, like almost with basically from what I can remember off the top of my head, precisely two exceptions, absolutely everything. We're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of band bands from like this early eighties to kind of the 1990s moment, which is the period that I've covered or been mostly interested in, um, is all just doing demo cassette production and distribution on the streets um, uh, immediately, right? Um, and interestingly in stalls, like set up right next to the stall of like the Cholo Ambulante who's selling fucking pirated sneakers that have been shipped from like, you know, underground New York or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, it's part of this kind of informal street kind of black market economy, not just in terms of the format it's being used and how it's predisposed to, to allow copying, but because it's sitting alongside on the streets, literally these other elements in the in informal economy, right? Um, which is a weird right. There's, there's, there's this entire culture, right, of, of piracy and, and, and copying in, in Peru. You might be sitting at a cafe, and somebody will come up with, I don't know, pirated books, or, or there's exactly. this there's immense market called polvos azules, where you can get any DVD in the world, basically, which is which is pirated. Um, and, and, I, I, but I mean, enclosed spaces, but they used to be literally out on the street, right? Like just street stalls, basically. Um, so. I'm interested just, we don't have too much more time, but I'm interested in um, the fact that uh, with this analog copying, though, um, I, whether it's the photocopier or whether it's the tape, uh, it's always in some ways imperfect. And, and, but that's a kind of feature, not a bug, as it were. And it, it reminds, it makes me think about the whole question of translation as well, because in some ways, what we've got is a, is, is both a literal translation. You've got songs that are in English and are being translated in, into Spanish and, and a sort of metaphorical translation. But these are also trans, transformations, right? There's also the, the, a space for kind of creativity for producing something different in Lima than what you might see in, in LA or Detroit or, or London or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and in that sense, like at least in terms of invoking kind of translation studies and sort of more interesting, more complicated notions of translation, the, the whole point is that there's always something lost in the translation, but also something gained, like there's something different about, it's not a mathematical equation, <laughs> right? If this now becomes this over here, it's like, no, something weird and creative and possibly quite cool while also at the same time degrading in a kind of like musical sense of like you've gone from this copy to that copy to that copy it actually does if at least if you're an audio engineer sound even more like shit right <laughs> once you're on this end of the scale right um and it doesn't sound that great to begin with because you're already using the kind of bottom denominator kind of technology in the first place right um but that's, that's kind of, you know, connects back to that point of, of underproduction rather than overproduction. You're not interested politically, socially, ethically, even at some basic level in trying to reach for virtuosity or professionalism or expertise or all those things that are actually themselves wrapped up in the kind of class logics of, of the official cultural industry, right? Um, and the ways that it basically systematically excludes other proposals, other alternatives and so on and so forth, right? So it's, it's a certain kind of celebration of that, right? Um, and the article closes with this contemporary band, Morbo, um, who just recently, I mean, I, I mentioned a cassette tape they produced in 2011, clearly in the digital era, um, but they've done another one more, even more recently, just in the last year, actually. Um, and they do it very intentionally to index this legacy of like our punk, <laughs> our underground punk, our way of mm -hmm. doing why is the cassette, right? Um, um, you know, to make it circulate, they immediately digitize it because <laughs> it's got to be on YouTube. It's got to be right. on whatever, right? But like, it needs to exist in that format because that's the story they're telling, right? The, the, this kind of legacy or continuity with that. Um, uh, with there's, that. there's this to and fro, like you mentioned. You've got the you've got the record, the Narcosis record, but in the middle, it, it's it's stamped with the the image of the cassette. I, I wanted to finish off with, with one uh, other example. It's related to this because it's about the ways in which um, copying uh, allows for transformation. It's the intro to the Narcosis um, album in which they basically do a form of sampling, I suppose, right? You know, so, so he, they take this speech from this industrialist and uh, he sort of... Um, interposes, right? So plays with, uh, he interposes certain words and sort of transforms it that way. 
and 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 you talk about the way in which not only is this sort of I don't know it's funny I guess it's a, a bit of parody, but it also has some political implications uh, which are quite specific to Peru. C could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, in that sense, just like very briefly, like it's interesting to sort of pose these questions of like where are dominant narratives about where something like sampling comes from. Like we often associate it with like the 70s, early 80s Bronx kind of early rap and what evolves into the hip hop scene. And that's of course true, but like people were playing with shit elsewhere too, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is a good example of that. Like he is in fact sampling at a time in which that wasn't super common in punk actually, right? Uh, it's a long story and people can read in the article the detail, the technical details of that, but basically he samples an old 45 record <coughs> Um, from I think the late 1960s of this sort of, he's, he was an Italian immigrant to Lima, uh, Lu Luis Panchero Rossi. Uh, in the late 60s, he basically was an icon of Peruvian, the possibility of the promise of Peruvian modernity. He was a banker. He was a sort of very successful entrepreneurial, entrepreneur in the fishing industry. Um, and then he got murdered in 1972. Um, in this kind of, you know, very kind of conspiratorial kind of context, according to the way it was read by the media and other people, because he was basically murdered by a very, very short um, Andean migrant, uh, the son of his gardener, right? So there's race and class kind of logics and structures that are built into this occurrence. Um, and what Narcosis does like a decade later, or over a decade later in 84, 85, when they're recording this and decided to sample the speech from this guy is to suggest that this icon of modernity that emerged in the late 60s and 1970s um, is the same kind of story as usual. Peru is an unfinished country, as Peru is a sort of deeply kind of repressed country, oppressed country as having inherently kind of difficult, if not impossible to resolve race and class conflicts. Um, and, a lot, and that sort of dialogue that they're making between themselves as a band, a punk band, an underground punk band with songs like Sucio Policia, Represión, very sociopolitical kind of oriented tunes um, is meant to sort of put that in some, to some sort of kind of critical relief, right? This notion that like, just, you know, stop, you know, believing these people who present themselves as like the, arb the harbingers of Peruvian modernity, basically, right? Um, it's not going to happen, <laughs> at least not in a nice, you know, efficient um, way that benefits everybody, right? Uh, that's that's precisely the point. So it's you know, people can listen to the song and kind of figure out what we're talking about, but like, um, it's just this really curious and creative um, insertion of the voice of Narcosis, literally the singer of Narcosis, superimposing his voice into this speech from the 19, late 1960s or early 1970s um, of this particular figure, right? And it's the way that the, dip, the, the disc, it's the way the cassette opens basically, right? Um, so it's a kind of opening statement in that, in that sense, right? Not just, to, not, not just to that cassette, but to like kind of Peruvian punk writ large because it was the first recording done basically, right? So anyway, super interesting. Um, it, it, it's fascinating. We haven't had time to talk much about the historical political context in Peru in the late 1970s, early 1980s, which is about violence and and ethnic uh, ethnicized tension and, and so on between the Andes and, and the coast. Yeah. But but it was really clear in in what you're saying in, in the article the way in which um, Peruvian punk is also making its own statement or contributing um, to part of that dialogue about. Um, Peru's failures, uh, its modernizations, the kind of this kind of I don't know uneven modernity, I guess, which is which is part of um, yep. Peru. Absolutely. So thanks so much, Shane. This has been a fantastic conversation. My pleasure. And, and thank you so much for the article. And um, yeah, th thanks for your time and generosity. All right, man. Take it easy.